Well, um, we're going to talk about fear this morning. It's not one of my favorite subjects. Um, there's a lot of Bible subjects that I don't really enjoy teaching on. This is amongst them. Anyway, the great thing about the story of the Lord in, with respect to fear is that we don't have to live out of it. It doesn't have to be the center of our being. You know, he says, be not afraid to his disciples in Matthew. And he's not saying that there's nothing ever to feel fear about. I mean, there are things to feel fear about. And we do live in mortal bodies. And so the way he's actually made us is to feel some of that fear. But what he is saying is, I don't want you to be centered in fear. I don't want your being to be composed of fear. I actually want your being to be composed of something entirely different. I want your being to be composed of my presence, my Holy Spirit. I am one with the Father, and God is love. And I want you to be united in that. I want your life to be consistent of love. And when it really gets composed of love, then fear is driven out. And uh, that's what I want to talk a good deal about this morning. I want to talk about the ways that the Lord comes in with His love and He does the work that's necessary. His first love for us that drives out fear and then through us makes us agents that can be so loving that we can help to drive out fear in others. We ministers of that same fear casting um, love. Um, is it interesting this year I've encountered this week I've encountered several people who are in the midst of a, a real crisis. I had a call from a friend who um, is he's he's just a little bit younger than I am. He's um, he's married. He's been in a career for a long time, and in the last six months his job has been so intense, and the pressure from his boss, who's a really destructive personality, has been so oppressive that um, things are coming up in him that he hasn't felt in years. I was talking to him, um, he just sounded like, he didn't sound like himself. He sounded drained of, of all his normal energy. He's like, I, I don't know what's going on, Eric. I've got, I've had panic attacks. I, I haven't had panic attacks in years. And my wife is pregnant and I'm worried about my job and I'm just not, I'm not sure what's going on. But we came to the end of the conversation and, and we, we both realized, well, the Lord, the Lord must be at work here because... He wants to come into these places of fear that are in your heart that somehow got stirred up. He wants to go right to the roots of that and reground you in love rather than in fear. So he knew that there's something that he had to bring to the Lord. Something that he had to have transplanted into his heart that would make him less shakable. Because right now he's really shaking. He's like, I don't even know if I'm competent to continue in the job. I don't think I have the confidence to continue in my job right now. He knew he needed something else. And my strong sense was that the Lord knows this. And it's not that he's going to become any less a human being or any less subject to the things that are troubling in this world. But it's not going to mark who he is. It's not going to be his identity. And he's not going to live from the center of fear. He's going to live from the center of God's love. And out of that will flow a tremendous amount of power. A tremendous amount of strength. And it's not because he's created a safety place for himself. It's because God has made him safe. And God has made him strong. Um, I think a lot of us may not have the same kind of fear that my friend was experiencing. I think, I, I don't even believe that I understood that I lived a lot of my life out of fear until I was probably, maybe I was mid-20s. I can't remember the first time I started talking. I, I ended up going to a couple different counselors for different reasons. And uh, I, I mostly was just saying, you know, I'm a typical Norwegian and I'm depressed. And I'm sad and I'm depressed. And I've had melancholy and I'm a philosophy major, so how could I not have melancholy? <laughs> and, uh, and I was talking to the, the, the therapist at the time and he, he's like, I don't think you really know yourself that well because I, I see you have some depression. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, no, I do have depression. But you also have anxiety. Well, I'm not aware of that. And then he helped me to begin to understand how so much of my energy in life was being drawn from fear. I was actually really trying to avoid vulnerability because something about vulnerability in my life was so horrible and so horrifying, so terrifying, that I had to run from it. And my main way of running was through achievement. I remember saying to a friend, before I even know I needed healing at this level, that um, there's two like motive powers in my life. And I think it's, it's, I can almost describe it as a fear. Completely clueless that it was fear. <laughs> it was actually fear. It wasn't just as if it's fear. It was really fear. 
know is like, I have a fear of not knowing and a fear of not being able. And therefore, I will be a student who will study everything so that I know. That's going to give me confidence. And I will be somebody who gets, you know, competent in all these different areas so that I, I will never be caught short being able to do something. I'll have confidence in the world. And you know, actually, that drove so much of my life. I remember um, at a certain point in my life, I was trying to discern, Lord, do you want me to go to seminary or do you want me to go to business school? That was the, the thing that I was weighing in the balance. And um, I had a sense of calling to the ministry. I always had that. And then um, something tipped the scales, and I felt like, okay, I'm going to go to business school. I'm going to get my MBA. And, uh, and so I, I, made, I made that decision, but so much of it was out of fear. So much of it was literally in the back of my mind. If, if this thing that God, I think, is calling me to doesn't really come through, this is my safety plan. This is my plan B. And it's my doing. So many of my decisions, I didn't even realize it, were based upon fear. And what's really scary about that is that at some point, you don't know enough. And at some point, you aren't capable. And if that's really what your strength or your confidence is rooted in, you're in trouble. And every one of us, at some point, will realize that. Even when we, um, oh, there's this great quote. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and share a quote. It's a little bit out of context because I lost track of my place here. But um, what happens is that this starts to operate in a really hidden way in our lives. This kind of fear that I'm talking about. It's anxiety because it's not as if, you know, somebody right now, it, like a, there's not a no tiger running after you, chasing you down and about to pounce you so that literally your, your life is in danger, right? That's not really what's going on here most of the time. I suppose it's possible, but it's really not most of the time. <laughs> Um, but what happens is something in the roots of our experience has have so affected our nervous system and it, it's become part of the atmosphere of our lives. And we, we operate in light of that. Um, there's a guy, his, his name is um, Arthur Roche, and he says, anxiety is a thin stream of fear trickling through the mind. If encouraged, it cuts a channel into which all other thoughts are drained. Wow, and that pretty much captures it, right? Anxiety, a thin stream of fear that can cut a channel into which all other thoughts are drained. And really what it is, is it's, it's, it's a belief. It's a kind of belief. We've been talking a lot about beliefs. And it's a belief that when it comes down to it, I'm not going to be okay. So I better scramble to make myself okay. That's the belief. And so therefore, I better do something to shore myself up. And I'm believing in what I can control. And it's, that's what fear is. It's a belief that, that this is one of the things that I, I didn't know, is that actually my depression was the experience of things that were bad in the past that made me sad. And my anxiety, I felt like a pinball. I would go back from despair to anxiety to despair to anxiety. And that's how I was living so much of my life. And the anxiety was an anticipation that I'm not going to be okay. And I'm going to find myself standing on the precipice and somebody's going to push me off. And it's over. And it's, you know, it's probably related to shame in my case. I've been honest with everybody here in this church that one thing that's driving a lot of my desire to know and to be capable is like, I don't want to be embarrassed. I don't want to be embarrassed. I, I have the same thing. I still have the same thing, guys. There's still slivers of it in my life. I get up here every Sunday and I think, Lord, am I going to be ashamed of what I'm doing here? But I'm going to trust in your love. I will trust in your love. Because you're going to use me. My strength isn't in my confidence. I mean, I do my best, but I'm weak. I do my best, but I'm imperfect. So really, everything has to be supplemented, and not just supplemented, it actually has to be rooted and permeated with His love, His love, His presence, His strength. I mean, I think a lot of times um, that, that it, it's, it's such a, a deeply rooted thing, it's hard to it's hard to even imagine how we can overcome it. I mean, fear has marked so much of our lives. I, I also think, I, I don't even think I'm aware, I'm not sure any of us are really aware how much fear does rule our lives, how much it does control our lives. There's this uh, story that a lot of us have been reading a lot about neuroscience, and there's a story about one neuroscientist who said, I'm going to really work it so that my system doesn't react to fear. 
I don't want to react to fear. Because he could see what it was doing in the, in the brain. It's actually shutting down the ability to stay open to experience. That's what happens when you're in fear. It's like, um, it, you know, you get really tense. And how can you be open when you're tense? It's the opposite of openness. And he, being a scientist, was going to try and get himself out of fear. And what he said was, um, this is my idea. I'm going to go sit in front of a, of a glass cage, and I'm going to put a cobra in it. And I'm going to go right up to the glass cage, and the cobra's going to go like that, but I'm not going to flinch. And he's, again, and again, and again, he tried to train himself out of flinch. He could never do it. Because the truth is, he's vulnerable. And there's something wired into the truth of what it means to be a human being. It probably goes back to the garden, right, guys? I mean, it's a serpent. It's dangerous. It's not good. And it provokes fear. Especially the fear that we're not okay. And especially the fear that maybe God isn't going to come through. And especially the suspicion that maybe he's holding out on us. Right? There's no way that we can, on our own, by our sheer willpower, by our own cleverness and strength training, resistance training, whatever, there's no way that you're going to be able to deal with this at the deep levels that you needed to. I want to just touch on a few things. It's going to, it's not going to be real expository preaching. Forgive me, folks, um, especially Father Steve, who, who, who likes us to do expository preaching. I do, too. I really do like it. It's um, the number one way we should do um, preaching, I think, in the church. But we have a smattering of scriptures. And I'm just going to touch in on a few things about how the Lord deals with fear and um, how it is that he brings us to a place of, of real strength, of real confidence. It's not rooted in our own competence or intelligence. The first thing that he does, there's really, it's, it's really mainly two things. The first thing that he does is that he creates a safe place. He actually does that. He creates a, um, a, a, a sanctuary, if you will, a refuge, if you will, like a fortress in which he deals with our fear. And the first thing that he does there is he, he deals with forgiveness. Now, why, why, would, why would that be significant? Um, I wasn't necessarily going to start here, but it just kind of occurred to me that when Jesus is talking to his disciples in our gospel reading this morning, he's talking about the peace that he's going to give, and it's going to be different from the world. And he's trying to prepare them for a really troubling experience that they're going to go through where their leader is going to die. And it struck me that this is like the, the front end of something that he's going to come in as a sort of a back end and really deliver to them. He's giving them a foretelling of a kind of a peace that he's going to deliver later on. And what happens in between there is, is horrible stuff. He actually suffers and dies. He's betrayed every single one of his disciples. I guess maybe you could sort of say that John and Mary didn't do this, but they all abandoned him. Peter denies him, his number one guy. And then they're and then they're not even aware that he's risen from the dead. And they're afraid. And they're gathered in the upper room. And they're behind locked doors because they're so afraid. And then Jesus comes in. And they're still shaking in their boots. And he actually comes in. Comes through the locked doors. And he breathes peace into them. And do you guys remember what he said? Um, he says... My peace I give to you, my shalom I give to you, and um, your sins are forgiven as you forgive others. Their sins are forgiven as you retain the sins, they're retained. So the first thing he does when he ministers his peace is he forgives them their sins. I think one of the things that we don't realize is, um, and, I, and I bring this about partly because it's Lent, is that a, a real way to be in a place of peace is to not have your conscience constantly troubling you. I think one of the reasons we're afraid is because we actually have a prick in our conscience that's like, you know what? There is something wrong with me. There is a way in which I've denied the Lord. There is a way in which I've abandoned the Lord. Or Thomas, eventually, doesn't even show up until later. There is a way in which I haven't been with him. And I haven't stayed with him. And I'm troubled about that. And when we're honest, we say it. There's a verse in Proverbs that says, um, I think it's Proverbs 28.1, the wicked run away when no one is chasing them. <laughs> That's so funny. The wicked run away when no one is chasing them. Isn't that like anxiety? 
there's nothing really happening right now that threatens my existence, and yet I'm running or I'm fighting, right? It's a fight flight. I'm going to achieve and make sure that never happens again. The wicked run, even when no one is chasing them. But the righteous are bold and courageous. Well, I mean, John is spending his whole letter to the church saying, you know, you, you have to live in righteousness if you're really the Lord's. You need to keep his word. You need to keep his commands if you're really his. And that's how you show that you're his. And if you're not practicing righteousness, but you're instead practicing sin, then you're not actually, you can't even say you know God. Well, does that mean that we have to be perfect in righteousness? Okay, well then I'm going to work harder. I'm going to become a moral expert. I'm going to become an ethical savant. I'm going to be a master of my own righteousness. No, not at all. What Jesus is doing for the disciples, he's showing them how they can be righteous by breathing his peace into them. He's settling their troubled hearts because he's present with them and he brings with him a peace that says, you're, you're with me again. And I'm with you. And it's good. You can sell it now. Um, the way that John puts it is, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and righteous to forgive your sins. He's, he's your advocate. You got the enemy in there. He's messing with your head and saying, you're bad, you're bad. See, you even did that. You know you did that. I know, I'm troubled, I'm worried. And Jesus is like, I'm, let me breathe my peace into you. I forgive you. And boy, is that. Stabilize it. Boy, is it center it. I don't, I don't need to be troubled anymore. But he does say, I want you to bring it into light. Confess. That's what Lent especially is for. We'll make our confession a little bit later. You'll even hear those words of comfort. That he's faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins. And then comes this peace. It's a peace that he breathes into us. I think in some ways we also have to breathe it in. Yes, that I receive. Um, maybe it's even embodied. We talk sometimes in this church about embodied prayer. Mm. Did you notice what I just did? I breathed in. And um, I did a lot of that entering into the sermon this morning. Like, Lord, yeah, I feel shaky. I have a, a bit of a heart condition. It's, it's like a supraventricular tachycardia and a, a, atrial fibrillation. It tends to come up in the middle of the night. And when I first got that condition, it was really scary. You know, it's like, man, what's going on in my heart? It feels like it's going to jump out of my chest. And that's fright. You feel your vulnerability. And um, the Lord gave me this way of prayer. And it actually, it's amazing because as I breathe him in, and I slowly breathe out, and I am literally breathing in the mercy of God. That's how I'm praying. Come, Lord Jesus, and breathing in his mercy, and then breathing out his peace, his shalom. I noticed that my heart rate would actually settle. I told it to, to the cardiologist, he says, oh yeah, you can do a vagal maneuver. That's, that's fine. You can do a vagal maneuver, that's kind of, what are you talking about, man? A vagal maneuver. I guess there's a vagus nerve thing, and if you actually do the kind of breathing prayer that I'm doing, you're literally breathing peace into your nervous system. And so when we make our confession, we're breathing out the sin that afflicts us and makes us feel conflicted and troubled, but we're breathing in a peace that brings a kind of a stability. And that's the first and biggest thing that I want to share with you, is that so much of the Lord's peace, it comes through that first love that establishes forgiveness because he's paid the price. But this is not just a safety zone, right? I talked about that. This is actually a strengthening that happens. And um, the way that I want to describe this is that it's, it's a faith that we receive through his love that fortifies us. It, it's actually, it's not just a fortress around us, but it's a faith that fortifies us. It becomes a force of life. So when we think about Jesus breathing His Spirit into us, His Holy Spirit, this is the same Spirit that by hovering over creation birthed a new world. It's the same Spirit that He pours out upon us from on high. And the same Spirit that causes new life, that causes the growing of life. 
In other words, it's a force of life, a force, it's a creative and generative force. And it, it, it makes of our bodies not just flimsy, mortal, ultimately dying bodies that go to the dust. He makes of them by his breath forces of life that can participate in a life that doesn't end. I mean, how else could you see Peter and the disciples shake, go from shaking to ultimately being bold? And, and really, e even in some ways in the face of earthly authorities, being brash. Such courage, such boldness. And it's because they began to realize with Jesus, who's the first fruits of a new work, the first fruits of a new creation, that as he breathed his spirit into them, and then as that spirit came in power, he's making a new temple out of them. And they're living stones, Peter would say. It's like this picture of, it's alive, but it's firm. Living stones. It's a temple filled with the Holy Spirit. And when they begin to speak words then, these words go forth, and they repel the enemy. And they're courageous to speak them. And these words go forth, and they're empowered by the Holy Spirit, and so they actually bring conviction. And people say, what are we going to do to become saved? They want to know, because the Spirit has spoken with such life-giving power that their words begin to be life-giving words the way Jesus was, because He's fortified them. They're not just safe and protected. They're now people that forge ahead in this fortification of the Holy Spirit, in this inspiration, this empowerment of the Holy Spirit. It's an outgoing and overcoming force. And what they do is, is that they say, look, within this world you may have trouble, but the Lord has overcome the world. And in this world, I may even die, and some of them did die, except I guess John, he died of old age. And most of them died of martyrs. Peter shrunk back from that in the beginning, but he eventually did. He bore witness with such courage. Paul bore witness with such courage. The disciples did this. And they did it because they're living in the light of a new kingdom that will not end. So their shakable, flimsy, frail, vulnerable existence is now strengthened from within, fortified from within, so they can forge ahead. There's nothing that could keep them shaking in their boots. They could even say, when the temple authorities said, you know, you guys got to stop doing what you're doing. We're going to obey God and not men. When He strengthens us, He may start with a period of being in the tent. We looked at Joshua just a little bit this morning. Most of his, the front end of his life is in the tent. He's being strengthened in a place of safety. Later on, as Moses goes, he's put in charge of the Israelites. And he has to drive out a lot of the enemies who oppose God's kingdom, just as the disciples had to do, in a different way, in a different context in the New Testament. And he's called by God to be strong and courageous, and he could do that, because God was alive with him. God was with him. And that's really what the Lord is breathing in, is when he fortifies us, the reason we can be strong is because we have his living, holy, life-giving, creative, life-generative, life-overcoming force. So every time, the, in Revelation, which is this incredible depiction that John has of the church under threat, the church that is in contest right now, the church that has to fight for its survival, and the flames of its existence are, are wavering, and Jesus is coming in and saying, I'm here to strengthen you. And the way that they overcome is that they overcome by, by, by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their witness. They overcome by the blood of Jesus, poured out the ultimate vulnerability, the love that went to the end, complete. It's another word for perfect. It went all the way to the end. And it overcame the enemy and threw him out. That same love the disciples proclaimed, even in vulnerability, in vulnerability, in their own death, looking death in the eye, they proclaim, His blood we overcome. And they bear witness to it, their word, in the power of the Spirit. So that then their blood, when it was spilled, actually their vulnerability, the thing that you really should be afraid of, right? When their blood spilled, it's powerful. It becomes the seeds of the church. And the church grows. The church grows. Because in their vulnerability, they pointed to Jesus' vulnerability, and they overcame. 
In their vulnerability, they proclaimed in the power of the Spirit a word of truth that went forth through their own blood and fortified the church itself. And she grew and grew and grew and grew. So we don't have to even shrink back from our vulnerability anymore. We don't have to shrink back from our frailty anymore. Because we've been forgiven, we can have confidence. Because He's fortified us and breathed His Spirit into us, we can have confidence. I'm always amazed that when John was near the end of his life, and I know I tell this story a lot, but I'm a John guy, I can't help it. End of his life, he's asked by his disciples, he's so old, he doesn't speak a whole lot, but you know how it is when you go meet somebody who you know is really wise, you know, man, I really want to get a piece of wisdom from this person. And they're going to him, he's the elder, he's called the elder, he's an old, wizened man. They have to sort of carry him in, and he's to be seated down in their midst, and he's literally rocking back and forth, and they say, Father, give us a word. Give us a word. And he says, my little children love one another. They're like, come on, give us a word. Give us, is that it? Is that it? My little children love one another. Is that it? Is that all you're going to say? It is enough. It is enough. When we've been forgiven and we've been fortified, what happens is that we're given such a flow of life that it bears fruit. And what he's saying is that I want you to so cooperate with this, this fear overcoming love that it begins to flow through you. And it begins to flow through you in love. And when that becomes complete, it drives out all fear. It drives out all fear. Everything that has come between you and an existence that's full of vibrancy and full of power and full of creativity can begin to flow out through you now and minister to others. So my little children love one another. There's no room for fear when your heart is completely overtaken by love. And in a way, what God is saying is like, that love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, and your strength, and your neighbor as yourself. What he's saying is, I want love to so permeate every part of you. Your love toward the Father, your love towards one another, that there's no room for fear. And you're no longer operating out of fear, but you're operating out of a creative, life-giving principle that's, that's going to cause your life to rise up in strength and cause your life to be even poured out for others in blessing and in generosity. In such a beautiful way that you're like a fountain. You're no longer a channel of fear. You're a channel of love and a channel of life. And Jesus had to deal with fear. And he overcame it with his love. That same serpent that's like jumping into the face of that neuroscientist and causing him to shrink back, that's the serpent that Jesus crushes his head through his love for the Father and for us. He so trusts the Father, that's where his confidence is, he so entrusts himself to the Father that he becomes the perfect, complete, total expression of love to us so that we can be okay. We're not okay by ourselves, but with him we're okay. We're forgiven, we're fortified, and life can begin to flow through us. And he says his prayer, Psalm 22, he says, By God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He really goes to a place of intense vulnerability and loneliness. He identifies with our shame, the taunting and the contempt, these dogs that surround him, is how the psalm prays it out. And he's praying his psalm. And then, at the same time, he's entrusting himself to the Father. He's saying, in, our father, in you our fathers trusted, they trusted and delivered, and then you delivered them. So commit yourself to the Lord. And what does he do? He commits himself to the Lord. He yields his spirit to the Father. Because he sees that God has not despised our affliction. So the afflicted will eat and be satisfied. And those who seek him, they'll praise the Lord. Let your heart live forever. Let your heart live forever. 
All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and the families of nations will worship before you, and the kingdom is the Lord's, and he rules over the nations. This is an incredible picture of mounting strength as he goes through this psalm. He starts with this place of ultimate vulnerability, brings his own prayer right into it, and that love overcomes fear, and, it, and there's this incredible installation of a kingdom that can't be overcome by fear ever again. And that's what he offers to each of us here this morning. There's a kingdom that's free from fear because of forgiveness, because he fortifies us, because he causes us to flow with this life that's creative and counters all kinds of destructive lies. Oh Jesus, I pray that in our vulnerability here this morning that we would not resort to our own devices, but we would instead receive your comfort. That we would just instead receive your forgiveness for the things that we've done that have made us believe the enemy's accusations. Lord, I pray that in that peace that you would strengthen us with your fortifying power and that your life and your love would flow through us. Lord, I thank you that you're teaching us this way, even now. I thank you, Lord, that you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins, to make all things right, and to make all things new in you, by your blood, by your spirit. We thank you, Lord, that this eternal life eternally springs with life. That we look forward to a spring not like this world that comes and goes, but a spring continues forever. I pray, Lord, this morning we would live in the light of that. We would live in the light of that truth. And so, we will not be afraid, but we will be loved. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.